The last video about erasing hell, I promise. I would just like to bring up some of the rhetoric which Chan employs in his book, which I see as attempting to browbeat his readers into submission, and also talk a little about his injection of his Calvinist doctrine into this book. Um, and if you've seen any of my videos, you probably know that I don't like Calvinism. I think that the five points of Calvinism are the most abhorrent set of doctrines ever conceived. So let's continue. In the introduction to the book, he has this to say, I have a tendency to read into scripture what I want to find. Maybe you do too. So there's already the implication here that what he's going to be doing in this book is not reading into scripture what he wants to find, and therefore you need to accept what he's saying at face value, uh, because the only thing that he's doing is bringing out the meaning of the text. Continuing, I'm not going to hang on to the idea of hell simply because it's what my tradition tells me to believe, and neither should you. That doesn't necessarily mean what he's intending it to mean. So what he means by this is, you know, I'm going to show you words which have been literally dictated by God, and therefore are unquestionable. Continuing, a God who, as the sovereign creator and sustainer of all things, has every right to do, as the psalmist says, whatever he pleases. God has the right to do whatever he pleases. If I've learned one thing from studying hell, it's that line. You must agree with Psalm 115, verse 3. So the implication here is that, you know, by God doing whatever he pleases, it means God's doing what I say he's going to do to people after they die. And because of that, and because you must agree that he can do whatever he pleases, you must agree that this is exactly how he acts. In chapter 1, he mentions 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And I'm going to read from the English Standard Version because um, it fits with his quotations in the book. And also, you know, the English Standard Version is kind of the de facto translation for neo-Calvinists. Um, go to esv.org and take a look at the people who endorse the translation. Um, so this passage reads, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, of course, the Francis Chan interprets this to mean God does not want all people to be saved. And he elaborates on this by saying that God has two wills, his moral will and his decreed will. So, quote, there is a difference between God's values that please him, moral will, and those events he causes to happen, decreed will. So his decreed will can be the exact opposite of his moral will, but it's still his will, so we're good. He then goes on, uh, Samson's love for Philistine women was against God's moral will, but became part of God's decreed will. God intervened to carry out his decreed will. So basically, God forced Samson to go against God's moral will, and Samson was punished for going against God's moral will, but it was God's decreed will that he be punished, and God can do whatever he pleases, so pwned. Uh, let's go on. In what sense does God want all people to be saved? The word underscores God's moral will, his desire to save all types of people. They are free to reject this because it isn't God's decreed will, but the verse captures God's heart nonetheless. So, they're free to reject the call to be saved because it isn't God's decreed will. But we've already defined God's decreed will as those events he causes to happen. So, God causes to happen people rejecting the call to be saved. But they're free to reject the call because 
he decreed that they were going to reject the call. And God can do whatever he pleases. Uh, continuing with 2 Peter 3, 9. This is kind of an Arminian uh, proof text, uh, which they like to use. Arminians who affirm uh, free will. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So, of course, this means that God does not wish that all should reach repentance. And uh, Chan uses this passage to say, God is not a bigot. He is not a racist. No, he, he simply chooses to damn people indiscriminately. And the main thing that I wanted to get to in this video is chapter 6, titled, What If God? He really needs some kind of award for the performance in this passage. There's going to be a lot of quotes here. He begins by saying, Now I want to approach the passage of Scripture that has caused me more confusion than any other Romans 9. Dun, dun, dun. Calvinist stronghold. The text itself is not confusing. Please read it for yourself. It's fairly simple to understand. Yes, it, it, it's so simple to understand uh, that uh, N.T. Wright and John Piper recently wrote books that focus on this passage intensely and come to very different conclusions. And just for fun, I'm going to link to a video which interprets the passage in a way uh, that's entirely unlike the Calvinist interpretation of the passage where it teaches double predestination. So that before the beginning of time, uh, God chose who would be saved and God chose who would be damned. So continuing, what makes it confusing is the newness of it. It's a passage that isn't preached often. If this is true about God, why hasn't anyone told me this before? Is it because we are embarrassed? Maybe we don't want to admit that we believe in a God who is so free to do whatever he wants. So, because God can do whatever he wants, it means that he's going to act in the way that I've interpreted this passage, and, um... No, you, you you need to you know shut shut down um, your your moral intuition when it comes to these concepts because God can do whatever He wants. That that's what's important. What if it's His way of showing those He saves just how great His glory and mercy is? What would you do if He chose to do this? But you're saying that He does. Refuse to believe in him? Refuse to be a vessel of mercy? Does that make any sense? Would you refuse to follow him? Really? Is that wise? What if is a probing question that forces us to face the inflated view of our own logic? It's another way of asking, just how high is my view of God? So, if you don't agree with me, you have a view of God which is not as high as mine, and we can't have that, can we? God needs to be as high as I have defined him to be. Continuing, if God gives mercy to whoever he wants, then why does he still find fault? Or, to put the question in another way, if we all need mercy and God grants it to some and not others, then who is really responsible, us or God? But look at Paul's answer to this question. But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? 
Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Romans 9, 20 through 21. Did Paul really just say that? Does the potter have the right to do whatever he wants with the clay? Then we must come to a place where we can answer yes to this question. Yes, the potter has this right. I often hear people say, I could never love a God who would. Who would what? Who would disagree with you and do things which you would never do? Who would allow bad things to happen to people? Who would be more concerned with his glory than with your feelings? Who would send people to hell? But this makes about as much sense as the clay looking up at the potter and saying, I really think you messed up here. Let me show you a better way to mold me. The truth is, God is perfect and right in all he does. I am a fool for thinking otherwise. So, if you question any of what I just said, you're a fool. He does not need or want me to cover for him. There's nothing to be covered. Everything about him and all he does is perfect. Chan continues, The fact is, Scripture is filled with divine actions that don't fit our human standards of logic or morality. They fit the moral standards of the authors. They don't fit our standards, true. And that's where the cognitive dissonance is coming from. Which is then attempt to be assuaged with this statement. But they don't need to, because we are the clay and he is the potter. So anytime you come across something in the Bible that offends your sense of moral intuition, you're supposed to deliberately ignore that. You're supposed to deliberately ignore your conscience and repeat the mantra, Clay meat potter! Clay meat potter! <laughs> Ultimately, thoughts of God should lead to joy because those thoughts designed the cross, a place where righteousness and wrath kiss. Would you think to rescue sinful people from their sins by sending your son to take on human flesh? No, I probably wouldn't have uh, designed that system. No, but, but clay meat potter. Uh, no one wants to ditch God's plan of redemption, even though it doesn't make sense to us. Neither should we erase God's plan of punishment because it doesn't sit well with us. As soon as we do this, we are putting God's actions in submission to our own reasoning, which is ridiculous for clay to do. This is what the view of the Bible being literally dictated by God ends up doing. it ends up turning people into sociopaths. And, and here's also uh, where, where problems of literally interpreting the totality of Scripture come up. Tan brings up the book of Lamentations, and he writes, As Jeremiah looked around and saw a bunch of bodies lying in the street, he said, God did that. So that means he did, right? No! God wasn't embarrassed to have Jeremiah write that. It's time I stop being embarrassed by God's actions. His thoughts and ways are infinitely higher than mine. It's time to stop apologizing for him. 
and start apologizing to him. And then he, he puts in this rousing prayer right in the middle of the chapter here. Please forgive me, Lord, for wanting to erase all the things in Scripture that don't sit well with me. Forgive me for trying to hide some of your actions that make you more palatable to the world. Forgive me for trying to make you fit my standard of justice and goodness and love. You are God. You are good. I don't always understand you, but I love you. Thank you for who you are. The... It's like the, the self-righteousness masked under self-deprecation, the martyr complex, the sectarianism, the uncritical reading of the Bible, regardless of how seriously he says he's taking it, 